our briefing committee underway. And I will open that meeting at 6.03 p.m. And just in welcoming you to the meeting, uh, just note, as with all uh, council meetings, including uh, briefings, uh, they're being live streamed, accessible to the public and also available on our website. And just ask councillors to start the evening with the Indigenous acknowledgement and the prayer, please. The City of Newcastle acknowledges that we're meeting on the traditional country of the Awabakal and Waramai peoples. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage and continuing the right relationship with the land and that they are the proud survivors of more than 200 years of dispossession. Council reiterates its commitment to address disadvantages and attain justice for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples of this community. Almighty God, we humbly ask you to bless this meeting, direct and prosper our deliberations for the advancement of your glory and the true welfare of the people of Newcastle. Colleagues, will you honour the memory of those who served and died that we might meet here in peace? Thank you, councillors. I have um, one request to attend uh, via audiovisual means from Councillor Wood, uh, who is uh, not feeling 100% this evening, so I thought best to uh, join from home. So could I just have a motion? Uh, thank you, Councillor Barry, seconded uh, by Councillor McCabe. Uh, all those in favour, please raise your hand. All those against? Uh, do I, and then looking around, that means we have no apologies or leave of absence. Do we have any declarations of pecuniary or non-pecuniary interest We'll just do it for the briefing committee uh, and then we'll do it for the De development application committee in that meeting. Uh, if there is none, I do have one, not for this briefing, but uh, for item 6.2, Inland Pool Strategy 2041. I'm going to declare uh, non-pecuniary significant conflict of interest on this item. Uh, if the briefing discussion moves into the tender for the operation of our inland pools, so so long as it's about the substantive matter before us, um, it'll be fine. But I just note that, like all of you, on Friday of last week, we received an invite to the Asset Advisory Committee meeting scheduled for Thursday, the 18th of May, where I understand that we are going to receive an update on the tender process for the management of our inland pools. It is unfortunate that I must declare a significant non-pecuniary conflict of interest on the matter uh, for the tender of the operations of our inland, inland pools, and I will manage that conflict by leaving the chamber and not participating in the deliberations on that matter. However, I will be participating thoroughly on the discussion of our 20-year inland pool strategy to ensure our commitment to these vital public assets are delivered. Uh, are there any other declarations? If there are none, I will move straight on to uh, our first uh, briefing, and that is from Hunternet around industry clusters. And I would just like to welcome Mr. Ivan Waterfield, who's the CEO of Hunternet, uh, if you are, are ready to join us. So we will just allow you uh, time to give us uh, the briefing and the update. And then at the conclusion, we will go to questions from uh, councillors. And uh, I just wanted to, before we start, I know Councillor Wood is online, but just wanted to acknowledge Councillor Wood uh, and uh, the generosity you yourself as a CEO have given uh, Councillor Wood, um, particularly around uh, access to uh, employment and jobs in your industries for people with a disability and that close collaboration that you've both worked on before before you get underway. So thank you so much for that. Well, thank you, Lord Mayor, Deputy Lord Mayor and Councillors for this opportunity to give you a briefing on Hunternet. Uh, why don't we have a show of hands? Who knows what or knows about Hunternet? Uh, not many, so that's a great opportunity for me, isn't it? So um, before I get into this, uh, I came on as CEO um, just over two years ago. You know, Hunternet's been going for 31 years. We will see that. Um, but it had actually lost its way, so I've, I've spent a lot of my time and focus about re-engaging with the members, uh, re-engaging with the community, and then from a, a local, state and federal perspective, actually getting strong engagement with um, the likes of yourself. So let's see if technology works. 
So as I said, look, we were incorporated or founded um, 31 years ago, um, predominantly out of the um, the demise of um, of the slipways, and then following on from that, BHP. So you know, like-minded entities, predominantly out of the manufacturing sector, came together, and uh, all about focus on um, collaboration and connection. And in the in the first early formative years, that was very very difficult for for entities that saw themselves as competition. But uh, obviously, it stood the test of time, so um, it's working well. But we focus on manufacturing, engineering, specialty services, consulting, defence, environment, and sustainability, and energy and resources. And those last two, in particular, with um, with what's going on with new energy, you know, we've got a big focus on that. Um, that's our board of directors. Um, good diversity, not only with gender, but also in respect to um, across all of our business uh, entities uh, in this region. So, Huntinet, um, what are we? What are we here for? Well, you know, we're strong on providing network opportunities, helping members connect. Um, with government programs, but more importantly, with uh, with people like yourselves who are uh, representatives of our region, um, lifting our members' profiles. Um, some of them, are particularly the small and medium entities, you know, they need the the boost up so that they get good, strong profile. Uh, we have an active engagement on social media and also in terms of advocacy uh, at all levels of government. Um, facilitating business opportunities. Um, we manage recruitment and training of apprentices and trainees, and you'll see that from our HunterNet Career Connections arm. And again, when we've got unemployment at uh, three and a half percent, you know, how do we maximise the opportunities for for people who are are in employment and for people who aren't at this point in time? Uh, we. Um, we have a website listing which actually provides, you know, good, strong circulation to our members via newsletters. Um, one of the key things I wanted to do, and you'll see it, we've got a refresh brand and we've got a very, very strong website which actually acts as a portal um, for information in from our members and then information out. And one of the things I've said to the state um, MPs and ministers as, um, as well as the federal is treat Hunternet as your friend because we can make your life so much easier. Because, um, and you'll see that on the next slide, you know, we represent 140 companies. Add that to the, the hosts who run our career connections, that's 37. It's actually north of 90,000 employees. So any information that we receive, you know, we funnel that out to our membership. And then if it's coming in reverse, you know, we're, we're, we're funneling that out to the people who make decisions. So it doesn't stop um, whether it's state, local or Fed actually engaging with their constituents, but it actually makes it easier because we're giving you the message of what's coming through, particularly from industry. So we actually engage with our members and um, and the broader community via a whole multiple range of forums. You know, we do resources and energy infrastructure and asset management, defense. Um, we have our Huntinet Leaders Forum, business services, and our general members meetings, which um, is actually taking place tonight. So I've been excused from that to come and present to, to you guys, which is um, very much appreciated. So one of the big focuses we have to all of our membership um, is get out what you put in. Um, as I said, we're standing at 140 members now. That's north of 90,000 employees. And the turnover of those 82 last year was um, $82 billion. So those sort of numbers make people sit up and take notice. And we obviously provide that strong advocacy, um, not only in terms of from government, but also for try and get private investment um, into the region. We've also, over the uh, over the period of Hunternet Career Connections, we've got uh, 2,000 apprentices and trainees placed in the market. And um, interesting, we, we had at our Chairs Awards, um, which is a terrible title, and we are changing that for next year. Um, 
we actually had the um, we had one of our awards called the Ivan Randon Award, which is uh, which was a local businessman. His son actually presented the Ivan Randon Award, and he's now in his forties, and he was actually one of our first apprentices. So it shows you the full circle of of what's available out there. So that advocacy we do, particularly for the for the next generation of uh, of people coming through. So one of the key things we do is we've got a future leaders program. It's uh, it's in its eighth year. We've got over 150 alumni on that, and it's again taking those uh, those next generations. It's a future leaders. It's not a young leaders program. We had somebody last year who was in their 50s, who was actually departing on their leadership journey. So this is a, a very, very strong program. It's a, a learning network, uh, problem solving. We actually run 12 uh, modules throughout the year and then they all get together um, as project groups. We actually, we usually have about 20 engaged per annum and we had to extend it this year because of interest. So we, uh, we took on 25 um, trainees for this year. Um, so it, it's obviously proven its worth. So if there's any interest, if you see any interest um, in any of your connections, then feel free to, to reach out to myself. So getting on to HunterNet Career Connections, um, as I said, um, we've provided over 2,000 apprentices and trainees into, into the workforce over its 26 years. Um, we've actually just hit in a very, very difficult market for our last two board meetings. We're now at 190 current apprentices and trainees, which very, very hard to source. Um, but we are engaging with uh, particularly um, school trip children through our um, school-based trainee program and aligning with some of the industry schools. Um, but again, if anybody's got Anybody in their circle who's looking for a, an apprenticeship and a traineeship, then, you know, feel free to reach out. Um, we're very, very hard markers in terms of the interview process. And we, uh, we applaud ourselves for that because, you know, we have a 70% completion rate on our apprentices and trainees where the industry average in New South Wales is below 50%. So, you know, we provide a very good, strong service to, uh, to our hosts. The board of directors for Huntinet, it's a, it's a lean and mean team that gets things done. So Hunter Defence, as, um, as one of our pillars is the Hunter Defence Task Force. And um, that's led by the chair of that is, uh, is Tim Owen, who I'm sure you're all aware of. Um, so Tim actually works for me as an industry advisor, and then we facilitate um, Hunter Defence Task Force. We have paying patrons so we can um, engage with a broader group. You'll see all of those on the on their icons at the uh, Defence Cluster page. Um, we meet monthly and this is all about strong advocacy um, at a local state and federal perspective to not just bolster what we get out at Williamtown, but to the, uh, the broader opportunities in the defence realm. Culminates, we have a, um, a defence conference, usually late August or early September, um, out in the Hunter Valley. We'd love to have it here. Um, predominantly, our only opportunity for that is really at West. So um, we've booked in for the, what, I think it's now Ridges now, not Crown, in the Valley. But we are looking seriously to come into town for the next one because um, the interest in terms of, uh, of hosting it is... Um, you know, we're getting well above 250, 300 people. Uh, one of the other new industry pillars is um, is what's called New H2. It's um, it's the strongest hydrogen technology cluster in Australia, and um, that was sort of seeded by um, the University of Newcastle near. Uh, they did that for the first year, but it became a bit uh, clunky for them to actually administer. So we took that under HunterNet's wing, and then we've set the template up exactly the same as we've done for Hunter Defence Task Force. So we're now getting on paying patrons, and uh, for those who did attend it, I know the uh, Deputy Lord Mayor attended, we had our hydrogen and energy 
um, forum symposium uh, earlier this year. So that was a, a, a strong success. One of my strategies, we can't just tag everything with hydrogen. We've got a massive focus on new energy requirements. So um, the more we start to to tie in that with the, the Port of Newcastle and other entities, the, the better off we'll be. But um, that's another one of our pillars and one of the ones that's obviously going to get a, a lot of attention as um, as we move forward into the, into the next decade. As I keep saying to people, and I close the conference out with this, you know, the first industrial revolution, depending on your, your knowledge of history, probably took about 50 to 70 years. We're now, whether it's the fourth or the fifth, we're trying to work through the next industrial revolution in less than a decade. So, you know, we really need to um, get all the advocacy, get the investment into this region to make sure that we as, as New South Wales and for our um, area, we've actually maximising all those opportunities. Um, some of those need a lot of um, consultation. So whether that's hydrogen, solar, or what's coming on, literally on the horizon with the offshore wind is um, those are the things we need to get the consultation going. So this is really just what new H2 provides. It's, um, it's just an alignment of like-minded entities, all of the peak bodies, as well as government entities in, in the region, tried to make sure we've got an open platform for, um, for connection and collaboration. Very short and sweet from me, just to give you that overview. This is more about an introduction. Um, for those who don't know, um, I just fully support any opportunity you want. You know, reach out to me, um, particularly uh, Deputy Lord Mayor and Lord Mayor, you've given us good support. And uh, with Councillor Wood, um, a different avenue, but where one of our um, directors on our board is um, an employee of Maywell. So we've really tried to work on um, the advocacy and opportunities for people who uh, really with a disability and giving those work opportunities. So there's some of the key areas, but yeah, I'd, I'd welcome any connection, any contact. We've actually just, after 31 years of, uh, of leasing and renting, we've just in the last two weeks moved into a, a brand new office that that um, we had some equity in the business. So we bought, purchased a floor at the Verve building. So again, we just had that fitted out. So we've now got a home for um, a bit of a stability for the next 30 years. So thank you very much, Lord Mayor, Deputy Lord Mayor and Councillors for the opportunity to, to speak to you this evening. Any questions? Thank you so much. It's wonderful to make the time, given you also had other commitments this evening. So we do really appreciate your time. I'll open it up to councillors uh, for questions. Uh, uh, Councillor Wood, sorry, I can't see the lights. It's not. Oh, apologies, Councillor Richardson. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering um, in relation to the apprenticeships and traineeships, do you facilitate those and, and link candidates with your members um, and then they're apprenticed to the members or are they um, apprenticed to HunterNet? Yeah, they're our employees. So you imagine we've got 40 hosts and then 190 employees, basically. So it takes a lot of uh, managing and facilitation. It's not like you've got those entities in, in one organisation, but uh, we've got a really strong team below us. If you look at some of the training organisations, they have um, one workforce development officer for anything up to 200 apprentices. So we don't ever let, we employ again a WDO, we don't let anything go above 40. So they've got opportunity um, to actually go out and check the welfare, understand, because we're dealing with predominantly a lot of young people who um, need some help. And particularly in the diversity angle, we've, we're managing to get a lot of female apprentices and trainees into the, into the workforce. But quite often, they're only one of two, particularly in a manufacturing sector. So, you know, we provide as much help and support as we can to make sure that their journey is, is easy. Thank you for the presentation. I'm not familiar with um, NERA that's part of the um, 
New Age 2. What does that stand for? Who's there? Oh, that's near nearer out at the university. So the um, oh, it was the old BHP uh, R and D facility. Yeah, so it's the so Newcastle it's near, Institute of uh, Energy, uh, Energy and, and Resources. Resources. Uh, they do really important work. It's probably worth um, if councils aren't aware of their work to also organise a briefing uh, from our Professor Broadfoot. If mm. Sorry to interrupt. It's not that one. It's N E R A, not N E I R. Oh, okay. I, I think it's a spellow on the presentation. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you. And can I just ask a question? I've I've got concerns about the the region's transition. I'd be interested to hear your perspective on it. That um, our educational institutions have been run down, particularly our TAFE, and we we rapidly need to skill people up for the new um, the new industries that are emerging. And I am concerned in the Hunter because defence has been identified as, as a growth industry. I'm concerned that um, some of the skills that we really desperately need to assist us to make that transition might get sucked into defence. And uh, I'm wondering if you, if you sense any competition there or, or any issues around that. Yeah, it's an interesting one. I mean, defence as an entity, I've been, you know, the first ones to sort of reach out to BHP, um, also to uh, AGL and go, you know, what is the opportunity to transition people from current jobs that they're doing into defence? However, we've looked at this in the reverse, is the transition for a skill set from um, whether it's like a Liddell or an AGL out at um, Bayswater is, it's probably an easier transition to take those people into new energy. If you take um, a gas fitter as an example, their um, micro-credentials or their upskilling to, say, dealing with hydrogen, it's only about another 15% of what they've currently got. A lot of the electricians, that skill set, whether you're dealing with uh, solar, um, offshore wind, or even the infrastructure around generators for hydrogen, a lot of those skill sets are very, very similar. Defence will be difficult because, you know, they're – in the prime seat now, and they're actually throwing money. Probably my bigger concern is um, there's an entity in South Australia who are basically tagging themselves as training, but all they're doing is throwing money at people to go across to South Australia and, you know, work in a, in a defence prime there. So I'm more concerned about the drain to other states. I think internally we, we've got massive um, challenges, but we've also got good opportunities. In respect to TAFE, you know, we're big, fully su supportive of, uh, of TAFE. And um, we were really pleased to see that um, when Tim Crackenthorpe got in and what um, role he's now been given, you know, we've been knocking on the door saying, what can we do to help? You know, we've, there's a lot of cracks to fill in from, you know, letting, letting TAFE um, the legacy is a sort of have lost it a bit, but you know we're busy working with TAFE to say, well, how can we help you with some of your micro credentials, whether that's in energy, defence, um, transport, so train building. How do we help you um, make sure that the platform for the next people coming through or the retraining of the current workforce to, uh, is there? But but we're not naive, and you know, as I said before, you know, we're down to three and a half percent unemployment, so. Um, getting new people in is always difficult. How we retrain the uh, the people who are currently in um, in the mining or power generation game. It's probably more the mining that's the concern. The power generation, a lot of work that they do now is actually pretty similar to what we'll need to do in respect to, you know, whether it's a coal-fired power station now or the power station is driven by other means, you know, that that's probably an easier transition. Um, but it's still going to be a challenge in terms of um, available workforce. Thank you. Just, just as you were speaking, then it prompted me to reflect that we have an economic development strategy that this council has put together. And uh, as you'd be aware, a lot of the focus of that is on talent attraction and retention and likely in the region. But 
Uh, it seems like it would be remiss of us not to ask you while you're here, have you looked at that, at that document and where are the gaps from an industry development perspective that you think we could um, raise the, the work that is done by this council um, to meet some of the needs that have been identified by, by your organisation? Yeah, we've, I mean, particularly since the, um, the federal election then the state election and then looking at local, we're actually looking at all the strategies that's in place you know, for that, whether it's investment or whether it's for training. So, yeah, we're trying to um, explore a lot of those and going, well, how can we add value to this? And to be honest, that's one of the reasons why connecting with you this evening is going, if you want us to try and review your blueprints and go, is this going down the right track or do we need to, you know, tweak things, then, you know, we're, we're more than happy to be involved in things like that. Uh, what I would say, I mean, you can obviously tell with this stupid accent, I'm not from here originally, but I, I, I was attracted to this. I came in 2003 with work. Um, with I'm from a train building background. You know, so the region has got lots of attraction. People want to be here. Um, so we will always have that. It's just making sure when people get here that we've got the ability to, you know, provide them the proper development, training, housing, you know, work platform, so. Are there any other questions, councillors? Uh, if there are no other questions, uh, we can move on to our second briefing and thank you so much for your time. And uh, I just wanted to check Council Wood uh, is online before I let you go, if she wanted to add anything. Just to say uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Ivan, for coming this evening. It's a great opportunity for Council to uh, hear more about what Hunternet is doing. And uh, really, I do see you as, uh, as leaders in your field and uh, an organisation that we should uh, be connecting with over a whole raft of issues. So thanks once again. Uh, thank you again, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Uh, in uh, finalising our first briefing, I will just uh, like to invite uh, Donna McGovern, uh, who was giving us our next briefing. Oh. Uh, certainly the CEO is going to uh, join uh Donna McGovern in the briefing tonight, uh, Kathleen Hyland, who is uh, the acting director, uh, is unavailable this evening due to family commitments. So whenever you're ready, uh, Donna. The Inland Pool Strategy 2043. Um, so as you're aware, we had a workshop on the 5th of April um, to talk through the draft Inland Pool Strategy. From there, from the 12th of April to the 12th of May, we held community consultation. So tonight I'd just like to run through um, a summary of the strategy and then also go into the... Thank you go into the community consultation summary at a high level. So just going through our, our current um, sand inlands pools, we have five Newcastle inland swimming centres. Um, they all have almost identical components. Um, I'm going to th run through the slides of the five pools that I showed in the workshop. Um, we know the pools are all seasonal. We have um, Beresfield and the other three smaller pools of Mayfield, Walls End and Stockton are all 30-week seasons and Lambton Pool is a 40-week season. But as I mentioned, they're all very similar, all the components. We have 50-metre pool in each one. Um, we have a learner's pool in each one. A couple of the pools have babies' pools. 
or toddler's pools. Um, and with Lampton, it's probably our flagship pool in the region with also a water slide and aquatic playground in there. Uh, we have limited accessibility options. We have um, heating that is mostly solar heating. So consistently um, we don't have that, that heated water throughout the season and they're all ageing facilities. So an average age of 53 years for all of them um, with Lampton being our um, flagship, but also our oldest pool at 60 years um, this season. So running into our attendance figures. So we're looking at, on from that um, slide, we're looking at roughly around 320,000 attendances each year. Um, this has been updated to show our attendances um, that have been included for this season at the four smaller pools, which closed on the 23rd of April. So we still have um, Lampton Pool to complete the season, which their season there finishes on the 28th of May. So I'm expecting we'll most likely have around 8,000 attendances. So I would expect that we'll get up to about 330,000 attendances this year. Um, this was our first year that we've had a full season since COVID. Um, it was really nice to see the schools back in the pools this year. And it's, it's really operating like we had prior. Um, just mentioning that spike there during COVID on that 2021 season, we had um, the forum pool was closed at that time and their programs came and used and um, uh, used Lampton Pool and also a little bit uh, with Walls End. So, um, yeah. With um, throughout the region, I think that um, you can probably see there that we're well serviced throughout um, the region with pools, both private pools, um, which are there mentioned on that screen, and also we have 14 public pools um, in neighbouring council areas. Uh, so we do have, we're really well supplied throughout the region. Our customer satisfaction as per a survey that uh, we had Micromex Australia undertake in 2019, you can see from that that our pools have a really high satisfaction level and rating. So we're looking at um, over 80% of people that are very satisfied and there's a high level of people loving our pools in Newcastle. And from our competitor centres that it was benchmarked against, there were nine pools that were benchmarked in that um, in this so survey, um, and of those, there were uh, public pools and private pools in that, which included um, the Forum and the ba and Balance at Mayfield. It included um, Arnold's. It included East Lakes. It included the public pools of Charlestown, West Walls, and Indoor, Spears Point, and Maitland. So our inland pool strategy 2043, it's our plan for protecting and improving Newcastle's public pools for the next 20 years. It's um, going to the background of that. Um, so as mentioned in the workshop, we had OTM planning group undertake this um, strategy and, and work to pull it together. Uh, they also were um, instrumental in, and also um, completed our 2020 uh, strategic sports plan. So they have a lot of experience throughout Australia in undertaking this type of work. We know the focus of the review was recommending an investment strategy to ensure each of the five inland swimming centres are fit for purpose over the next 20 years. Um, and also a plan to enhance our facilities um, at all five facilities as well to meet the needs of the changing uh, demographics and the needs of the community. 
Um, all of our pools, as I mentioned earlier, are an average of 53 years of age. Um, and uh, all of these pools were, were built around that 1956 uh, post-Melbourne Olympics era. So um, built for lap swimming. Just with this slide, it shows that um, within 15 minutes of our swimming centres, um, we cater for our Newcastle residences and also beyond that. Pleasingly, with our pools being, um, you know, the age they are, we, um, from the review that was undertaken within OTM and J JWC engineers, um, it's pleasing to note that our uh, shell life of the pools is around the 20 years, which is, which is really good news. And uh, as long as we um, keep a good maintenance schedule, um, we're looking in, in very good shape. We have rankings there from um, the Maloney Asset Management System scale that JWC Engineer uses, and our rating rates from very good to fair, which was really pleasing to see when we had those results come through. So the investment into the pools, we're looking at uh, future inland pools and, and having categories for those. So with our Hunter, um, we're looking at, you know, in that category, it's serving the entire Hunter region and focuses on facilities that support high performance programs and services. With the Greater Newcastle, it serves all of Newcastle along with parts of neighbouring councils. District will serve a cluster of communities and then tourist would support broader city um, tourism strategies. That slide's quite busy, but just in summary, um, the Hunter the Hunter lacks a modern major event aquatic facility, um, and this really should be addressed in the Hunter Park plans. Investments needed by New South Wales government for a venue of this design. Um, and it's recommended that this facility caters for swimming meets, um, water polo and diving. In the category of Greater Newcastle, we're looking at Lambton and Walls End um, that have similar catchments, which was shown on that previous slide. And these pools are well positioned to upgrade facilities and services. Um, for now, the future direction of both Lambton and Walls End is really well considered in the strategy. Uh, the district category, we're looking at Beresfield and Mayfield pools, um, which will be improved over time to meet the needs of the immediate surrounding catchments. The improvements will differ from Walls End and Lambton in scale and mix. And then our tourist category of Stockton, um, with that coastal location and being adjacent to the Holiday Park and the small catchment of 4,000 people um, it'll be improved or looking to be improved over time to increase, increase opportunities for formal, informal leisure and recreational activities. Okay, so we'll go into the community consultation, which closed on Friday. Um, there are a number of engagement, uh, uh, communication and promotional activities that we held during this time. And... Um, all being able to provide feedback on the Have Your Say page or emailing um, on that email address of engage at NCC. We also included, um, we had, we've formed the Inland Pool Community Network, which is really pleasing. And it's a group of, um, of members that really um, are dedicated to their swimming and, and love their inland pools. And it will help us and that, that group will play an active role into the future in shaping the way we manage and invest over the next 20 years. In regards to how we um, promoted and communicated that the consultation was happening for the strategy, we actually did a, a mail out um, of a flyer to all Newcastle residents. Um, so 
you could say that that was really well communicated and um, so the strategy was um, given every available opportunity for people to know about it and to provide their feedback about our important inland pools. We also had um, social media posts. We had um, information in e-newsletters through Newcastle Voice and also we tapped into Bluefit, um, Bluefit's membership base and their newsletters. We had pop-up pop sessions at each of the five inland pools and we also um, had a media release. Okay, so in on the Have Your Say um, page, we actually had 1,300 visits to that page, which was really pleasing to see. And of that, only 124 people provided feedback. So you would like to think that based on that, people were happy with the strategy, having a look at it. And then if you also have a look at the sentiment, um, that was also really pleasing to see that we received 47% um, of um, positive comments and neutral and was 43 with negative being only 10%. So that was really pleasing for us to see that result with the community feedback. So we've also, um, from the feedback, we had a look at what the themes were that were identified. You can see there that a longer season and year round facilities were the highlight of feedback along with heated pools and um, upgrades to facilities and then general, um, generally support and positive comments. We then broke that down into by pool um, of the top five themes. And you can see that generally uh, for most pools there, that there was um, feedback on each of those um, through the, yeah, the feedback. So looking at um, the action summary, um, so based on um, the feedback that we received, that was the need for a year round facility and or extended season, and also questions about the New South Wales government proposed um, sport and leisure precinct at Broadmeadow known as Hunter Park. We'll be updating the strategy to include a commitment from us that we will uh, review the strategy within seven years. So to review the uh, strategy with, within seven years, we'll ensure that our short-term actions have been delivered, the technical advice remains valid, and the status of Hunter Park is considered. Also there, um, we just wanted to confirm that all five swimming centres will have works undertaken in the short term to improve accessibility. Um, in the strategy, we'd left out on the table Stockton, but we will update that to include um, Stockton because the intention was that that was at all five swimming centres. We also received feedback um, both for um, and against having an entire Lambton Park um, indoors. So the intention in the strategy, and if you have a look at that investment detail, there was an investment cost of $6 million there. So it's, it's basically looking at a hybrid of um, both indoor and outdoor components. It also is really important to note that um, the green space is something that the community value and that will be kept. Also throughout the strategy, there's a few terminology updates. So I'm not sure if um, anyone noticed this, but we did have the term inland pools uh, network hierarchy. We've made a change to that to be categories. We think that um, that probably better fits within um, what we're doing. We also have, um, will update terminology to refer to the swimming centres as they're formally known. For example, if we haven't put Lambton Park War Memorial Swimming Centre, we will update that throughout the document. Okay, so 
that concludes the presentation this evening. Um, Jeremy, is there anything you would like to add to that? Good evening, councillors. Um, yeah, only just to reiterate how pleasing it's been to, to go out and, and as you've seen, a really extensive community consultation. Um, it's not every strategy that we, we send to every single resident in the, in the LGA. Um, we recognise how important our inland pools are, how important they are to our community, how important they are to our councillors. For that reason, we, we felt that it was, it was critical to, to, to make sure that we reached out to everyone. Um, and as Donna said, there was a, a very high level of engagement um, on the Have Your Say page, but a relatively um, low percentage of conversions into submissions. And typically, um, the real engagement is, is that if people are looking at it and then they're not following through with a, a formal submission, that tells you that they're quite comfortable with what they're seeing, and, and I'm not surprised by that. Um, the only thing that we, Donna, we, we failed to mention that is, um, is, is worth reiterating is that there was some concern uh, in the feedback that the strategy didn't clearly enough articulate that we would be setting aside a million dollars a year um, for the, the ongoing upgrades to the pool, and, and that was very much a, a deliberate, sorry, the, Omitting it was not a deliberate strategy. The, the, the logic behind the setting aside a million dollars a year was to make sure that there could never at any stage in the future with future councils and future CEOs um, be a claim that we didn't have the funds to upgrade our pools to a level that was consistent with the commitments in the, in the strategy. Um, there was feedback that that commitment wasn't clear enough so we have just made that, that commitment more clear, more succinct in the, the strategy. Um, Donna also touched on the, the other change that was, was made was a commitment to undertake a formal review of the strategy within the next seven years. Um, while we recognise and you, you like strategies to the last or 20 years is a, is a standard length of time when it comes to, to a, a pool strategy, um, certainly within the, in local government, um, we do also recognise um, that there are a number of actions that we've committed to in the short term, which the strategy defines as from zero to seven years. And uh, I would hope that the council and, and the community would be comfortable in a, a commitment that we're effectively holding ourselves to account. So we'll go back within the next seven years um, to demonstrate to the community and to councillors that we've delivered on every single one of those, those commitments to upgrade our pools in that, that those that are to be done in, in, in the short term. Um, if there are any count questions, councillors? Uh, so what I'll do ahead. is um, now mm -hmm. that the briefing is finished, um, if there's questions, let me know and I'll direct them. But uh, on the close of the briefing, I just wanted to take a moment to really thank Donna and her team, uh, as well as Lynn Duffy in her absence and Kathleen. Uh, this has been really over 18 months of work. Um, with consultants, um, with technical engineers, um, with the community uh, that you've uh, brought together with this technical skills and expertise. It's a huge body of work. And I have said this at council meetings previously on this topic. The, the issue of pools and um, those ageing assets, very similar to every council around the country, you know, all built uh, post uh, the Melbourne Olympics, we're not that dissimilar to many other council areas. But what is fantastic that this council has, even if you go back to the, the start of the strategy where you put the resolutions in uh, dating back about three or four councils ago, they were um, saying they're doing one thing and not doing it and changing their mind. And there wasn't really a very clear articulation until the work that you've done over the last couple of years has come to fruition now. So I just think it's really important to acknowledge that work that has gone on. And I know it probably would have been done sooner, but COVID did get in the way of all our service delivery for a few years. And I just wanted to put on record my appreciation for that work. And I know in the feedback I've been getting from the community around the strategy that's been out for, for public exhibition has mostly been positive, knowing that council has a very clear plan to not only preserve these public assets, but also invest in them in the way that the community wants that investment in short, medium and long-term strategies. Uh, this is the first time this council has actually dealt with these assets properly, I believe. 
And that's a testament to your team, Donna, and the work that you've done. And also, um, obviously, with the compliment of the executive directors and the CEO. So I just wanted to say that before um, we go into our questions, because I have been around for a while and I've watched many councils try to deal with this issue. And I think this work that you have done will be an exemplar now for other councils. Are there any questions? Uh, Councillor McKenzie. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Just, just one, and it's in relation to the $1.25 million that you've said in the short term uh, has been allocated for disability improvements. I wondered if you could outline in a bit more detail what those were and how short is short term, I guess. Thanks, Councillor. Um, with, uh, once we adopt this strategy, um, we will go into detailed planning of what that actually looks like. But the types of things that we'll be looking at doing is um, putting some sort of platform or hoist um, into those um, pools as a short term. Um, in our short term investment, it's over in the seven years. However, that is one of um, our focal um, priorities to in, in increase and improve our accessibility at all of our pools. There's also, Councillor McKenzie, the intention to review the accessibility requirements uh, of our change rooms as well. So that's the, I guess, the other component. One about making sure people can actually utilise the pools themselves, but also that they have a dignified place in which to actually get change in the change rooms. Uh, thank you. Are there any other questions? Oh, Councillor Wood, pardon me, sorry. Yeah. Uh, thanks very much, Donna, for your presentation. Um, I just wanted to uh, ask a couple of questions about accessibility. I note that 15% uh, uh, of the uh, uh, comments actually uh, talked about accessibility at the pools. And, uh, and I understand, I'm assuming that you would have had some uh, feedback in particular about Walls End Pool. Um, the, I, there is no um, accessible toilet at Walls End Pool. And, and in my opinion, without an accessible toilet, you we can't say that we're making the swimming centre accessible by simply putting in the uh, platform into the pool. I don't believe a person who has mobility issues and who needs an accessible toilet is actually going to be comfortable using the facilities in the absence of one. So my question is, is it possible to uh, prioritise uh, the uh, uh, a modification of the existing change room so that we can have an accessible uh, toilet at Wall's End at the same time as we create accessibility directly into the main pool. Thank you, Councillor Wood. I had a conversation today about how we actually go about prioritising accessibility at, at Walls and Pool. I, I couldn't agree more. So what does that mean in terms of our budget? For example, uh, for next financial year, 23-24, mm. is it going to be possible to install the platforms into the pools, and I note the estimate is $250,000 for each one, is it possible to include in that budget uh, provision for the creation of an accessible toilet at Ball's End? Uh, Councillor Wood, so what we're doing first of all is, is going through the, the design process, the scoping process to actually understand what is possible and what the cost is once we confirm that things actually are possible. In terms of, of the budget, um, a question of cost will be dealt with through, as things always are with capital works, will be done through the quarterly review process. But what I don't want you to take from tonight is a sense that, well, it, it isn't in the draft budget, which will be, I hope, adopted by, by the council next week, and therefore it'll need to wait another 12 months. Um, we have a, a quarterly review process, so we will have plenty of time in order to, to secure the funds from this council um, as we work through the design process to ensure that they can be done um, over the next 12 months. The question will really be just in terms of how we go about uh, doing that work and minimising the uh, impact on the operation of the pools. Just on that, and obviously very supportive of um, Councillor Wood's comments, uh, going through this process of the 
uh, strategy development has been a long one because it has entailed significant engineering assessments uh, on all of these facilities to ensure the type of investment we're talking about over the next 20 years is worthwhile, um, i.e. the pool shells are in a state where we can make this investment. The strategy that's been out for public exhibition was very clear that one of the first uh, strategies that we will be implementing is the accessibility strategy. And the funding for that is already highlighted in the strategy. So it's actually up to us as a council to firstly take on the feedback, which, we're, which we have uh, done really in the terms of um, officers collating that. I'm expecting that we will now get a report on that feedback. It, it are up to be count, up to us as a council to adopt that strategy, bearing in mind it's not adopted. And then once that strategy is adopted, it is then for us to actually allocate a budget against that uh, each financial year. Now, what's been very hard in the pool space over the last couple of years, not putting um, obviously COVID aside, is that in the absence of uh, a coherent long-term strategy that needed to be based on an evidence approach to these assets and this asset management and councils, previous councils actually refusing to deal with this issue, we haven't had a strategy on pools but to be fair to the City of Newcastle, no neighbouring councils have either. It's a very piecemeal approach to pools. And what we have said is accessibility and disabled access is a priority in this strategy and therefore that will be funded in the first seven years. How that work is funded will then go through a process uh, with us through the budget, through quarterly review processes to make sure that we are distributing our funds through all of our assets. And we've been doing this for, for some time, particularly tapping into New South Wales government grants uh, for fully accessible change rooms, which we have done uh, adjacent uh, to Nobby's Beach and to another a number of other sporting facilities that are currently under design and construction. There is specific funding to for these accessible change rooms. Uh, it's called Changing Places. And I imagine that once we have the strategy in place, we'll be able to go uh, and access those funds to upgrade our change rooms in our pools, how we want to do in our strategy to meet community needs, bearing in mind that no other council is doing this. Lord Mayor, I, I've confirmed today that we do have sufficient funds in the, the draft budget to undertake the, the draft work, the design work, Correct. not the construction, but so in other words, there, there should be no concern from any of the councillors that a lack of funding will prevent us from starting the project. Yeah, there's obviously uh, councillors have been uh, working and wanting this strategy to come to fruition for quite some time. And you're obviously ass assuming councillors uh, as a majority are happy with the strategy, uh, with the changes from the community feedback at our next council meeting, that is when we'll be able to implement these changes, which I think uh, the community uh, really wants and also needs. Uh, I'll go to the, there's one more question from Councillor Church, I believe. Is that correct, Councillor? Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor, and thank you for your presentation. Um, just a couple of key areas. I'm just seeking some clarification. The first is that um, obviously a plan without funding is just a piece of paper that would gather dust. And I'm very pleased to see that at least a million dollars a year has been earmarked. What I don't understand is uh, how that's going to be spent, whether it's a million dollars a year or we're going to bank it and spend it at the end. Um, and is it on new works or is it simply going to be care and maintenance uh, or refurbishment? Uh, are we actually addressing the infrastructure backlog with that, um, that uh, funding? So just a bit of an understanding about how the, the rollout might occur and um, is that enough money to do what needs to be done to maintain the pools to a high standard for 20 years? Uh, Councillor Church, I'm, I'm happy to, to talk to that. The, the million dollars is separate to the maintenance budget. Um, so that has, we, we've always set aside funding for the, for the maintenance of our pools and, and that'll continue to be the case. Um, the million dollars is, is set aside um, in principle for, for those items that are beyond the next seven years. Um, so the money will be set aside in, in uh, restricted funds um, with, for the singular purpose of updates to our pool. Uh, those commitments that exist within the, the short term will be funded from the capital works program. 
Thank you. So you're going to be banking a million dollars a year for the first seven years? That's at the council's discretion, but that's the recommendation. Yes. Okay. So all we'd be doing for the first seven years is just repairs and maintenance? No, Councillor Church. Um, the, the works that are planned to be undertaken in the short to medium term, which is from now for the next seven years, will be funded out of the Capital Works Program. So our intention in that strategy is to undertake all of the work that is identified in the short to medium term in the strategy, of which there's a significant amount. And we need to fund that, we intend to fund that with the permission of the council out of the, the Capital Works Program. So on an annual basis, as part of the, the consideration of the budget, you will see a series of, of proposed capital works for each of our five pools. How much do you think that'll be? Can you give us a bit of a guide? Uh, Councillor Church, it's mapped out in the strategy. I can't remember the numbers off my head, but you can add them up. They're in the strategy. Okay. Second question, Lord Mayor, with your indulgence. Um, a lot of the strategy tends to hang on uh, an aquatic facility being built at Hunter Park. Um, there doesn't... There doesn't appear to be any commitment from anyone to do that. There's no business plan. There's no site. Uh, there's no funding. Uh, there's no planning. And it could be a long time before we see an aquatic centre at Hunter Park. Um, in 20 years, uh, maybe we could have planned to build our own aquatic centre um, without having to rely on the, the state government um, and their, um, their location. I'm just wondering, um, are we handing this over to... Uh, state government responsibility and may we not see this delivered? What, I might, to medium term. what I might do is just, uh, I know this is a question for staff, but really it's a question for the New South Wales government. Uh, what, what I think uh, is a reasonable response and anyone who's looked at the strategy, it's actually all about our five inland pools, but we're not putting our head in the sand and pretending that the New South Wales government haven't flagged that they want an all year round aquatic facility at Hunter Park. But what this strategy does is actually deal with if they do build it or if they don't build it to make sure all of our pools are protected, maintained and enhanced. And that decision is a matter for the New South Wales government. The strategy is not based around it at all. That's a complete falsehood. What the strategy does is actually deal with announcements by the New South Wales government and then make sure that we have a clear strategy for our five pools. Now, there is also a component of the strategy document that actually shows the amount of uh, investment and funding upwards in some cases of 60, 70, 80, 90 million dollars that the New South Wales government have put into council pools and facilities around New South Wales, not here, but in other places. So it really clearly articulates that there is funding coming from the New South Wales government to pools, but it's just not coming here. Now, obviously, that is a significant issue. Uh, uh, an all-year-round aquatic facility of the type that has been mooted by the New South Wales government would be upwards of $130 million. Now, we all know we've had many resolutions at this council for many years. That is absolutely beyond local government. That is more than our entire works program through the city. It is not going to happen ever by local government. However, if it was to happen, it would be the New South Wales government doing it, which is fine and very welcome. But if they don't do that, or well, I would expect it would take quite some time, as it already has done, to figure that out, we have a very clear strategy to deal with the improvement and enhancement of our five pools. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Councillor Church, I'll just remind you that at Hunter Park, City of Newcastle isn't a landowner. We don't have any land within Hunter Park. And so therefore, I I'm not sure that there would be any expectation from the general public, or and I would certainly hope not from this council, that we would be funding the construction of aquatic facility on land that we don't own, that indeed is actually owned by the New South Wales government. Furthermore, there actually is a business case for Hunter Park. I've seen it. Um, I've signed confidentiality agreements, so I, I can't speak to it. But what I can say is that it doesn't include an aquatic facility. Now, in terms of the timing and the commitment, we all know that there's recently been a change of government and they would undoubtedly be grappling with that, that business case and, and making decisions on, on whether it, it you know, stands up to an, to an investment case. Um, but we'll simply have to wait and see what the, what the new New South Wales government does in that space. But what I can say is that I know that the various government agencies who are the landowners are progressing um, at a fairly rapid speed with, with uh, the design for, uh, for progressing Hunter Park. 
Uh, thank you. Are there any other questions, councillors? Councillor McCabe. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Can I just ask, um, in terms of accessibility, I wonder if uh, any of the submissions asked for a ramp to be included, because I just, um, I'm interested as well as what's what's best practice for people with mobility constraints, um, whether or not being able, to, people who are able to walk but would find the stairs difficult if they prefer the ramp, or to use, um, are they called the water, the water wheelchairs? Um, and whether or not that would mean a modification of the shell and if that's why it's not happening, it's just, yeah, just a question around ramps and accessibility. Um, thanks, Councillor McCabe. In the uh, feedback piece, we had a number of um, pieces of feedback that um, included ramps, it included um, platforms, and it included accessible change rooms. So there was a combination. So. Um, we're hoping that the strategy will be adopted next uh, next week when it goes to council. Um, with that, we'll then determine, and as Jeremy mentioned before, a scope of works design to actually do modifications in a as a ramp into our pools will cost a lot of money. So, um, and whether it's even will compromise the existing pool shells as well. So um, that's all what we need to determine, uh, but very likely that we'll be going down the path of platforms. We'll, we'll go through. We have, um, as you saw in, in Donna's presentation, we have an inland pools community network. Um, there is an accessibility representative on that. Um, so that's that's why when when we, we I had Councillor Wood's question before, it's not simply a question of flicking a switch and all of a sudden we will make our, our pools accessible in terms of the ch change rooms as well as access to the pools. There's actually a significant amount of consultation and work that will need to be done, both on the structural integrity of the pools in terms of ramps um, and the broader question. When you do a ramp, you actually take a lane out, um, out of service. So while well, that might be possible at, at Lambton where we have is it nine lanes? Nine lanes. Um, at Stockton, for example, much smaller pool, 50 metres in length, but I'm going to guess it's about five or six lanes, seven, seven lanes. So there are those questions. So it's, it's not a simple question. So I, I'd like to give you a simple answer tonight, but we simply can't. It's going to take work and consultation with the community. What I can say um, is that a ramp is part of the, the solution um, for the, the very um, significant restoration that we're doing at Newcastle Ocean Baths to ensure that people who, who would like to have a ramp, have access to a ramp. Very popular at our ocean baths, for sure. Can I ask one more question? Um, I didn't get time to have a look again at the strategy today, but I saw an interesting question raised about the, the possibility of building an, an indoor pool at the Lambton site, uh, where the placement of that would be. Is, has that been determined or is that something that's um, for detailed design? What's the plan for that? So again, that will be part of detailed design. So at this point, no, it hasn't been determined. But what I can say is it won't be replacing one of the existing pools. Just in terms of process with strategy documents, a lot of work goes into getting the strategy right. And that's what uh, our focus has been. And then once this is adopted, um, if there's changes uh, to the original post-community um, consultation, it will come back to us for a discussion and, a, and adoption. And that's a very clear direction in that document of how the detailed design work will actually pan out. And that is this important work that has taken a couple of years is done up front, so it's not a piecemeal approach, pool by pool, year after year, changing councils. It's actually a really solid plan for the next 20 years to protect those assets that we can all be really confident about. It, are there any other questions? Uh, Councillor Adam Chair. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. And thank you, Donna and CEO as well for your input and for pulling this work together for us. I just wanted to reflect, uh, noting that our conversations have been largely around accessibility and 
uh, wanted to thank you as well for being very upfront and entering into this exhibition period with the strategy, uh, noting what accessibility needs are actually required to bring our pools up to standard in a coordinated way. Uh, so I do want to thank you for leaning into those conversations, which can be tough conversations, but really proud to be part of a city that is leading the way in doing that uh, and noting that, you know, it's come to our Access and Inclusion Advisory Committee. You have Lauren Parker sitting on the representative group as well. Uh, so ensuring that we're doing this the right way and also noting as has come out in the conversations and as it's really evident in your strategy document that there are diverse accessibility needs uh, and they, they do really need to be done the right way. And I uh, am confident that we are going about doing that the right way to make sure that we are bringing them all up to grade in a standardised and coordinated manner. So thank you. Uh, thank you, councillors. Are there any other questions? Councillor Duncan. Just a very quick comment, and I guess following on from what Councillor Adam Check has said about I'm um, just I'm really delighted to see this work. It's obviously been a lot of work that's been done, and I guess like the Newcastle Ocean Baths, I'm really proud to be part of a council that has decided for the first time in decades to stop kicking this can down the road. Uh, the same applies with Newcastle Ocean Baths. You know, it's long over to you and incredibly welcome. So thank you. Uh, Councillor Winnie Bartz. Thanks, sorry, love me. Um, just briefly wanted to reiterate my thanks. Um, this is something obviously that's been at the top of my agenda since I was elected in 2017 and know very well the work that Donna and her team have put into this. And I also guess I would like to hope to see the success come from this strategy same group of individuals developed our strategic sports plan along with our community and we've had really good success at ticking off those objectives in that strategic sports plan and it is really a, a testament to the way I hope this moves forward in that we've actually been able to work together with organisations to get grant success to really start ticking off some of those projects and I really hope to see the same success with this strategy. Thanks councillor. Are there any other questions or comments? Uh, thank you again for your time. A couple of councillors touched on it, so have I. Uh, when you inherit decades of uh, maintenance backlog and councils that haven't made decisions or actually invested in assets like well, whether it's the ocean bars at 100 years old or all of our pools, it takes a lot of time and effort to actually make sure we're methodically going through the process of having really solid plans for all of these assets. And this work is exceptionally important. So thanks again. Uh, councillors, that will close our briefing committee at uh, 7.15. In doing so, I will open the development application committee meeting at the same time. And uh, also just, uh, note um, that the development application committee meeting is also being live streamed and webcast and, and is available on our website and just go go through uh, the process of uh, requesting attendance via audio visual means from councillor wood councillor barry moved uh, councillor walk seconded all those in favor please raise your hand all those against uh, thank you councillors there are obviously no apologies or leave of absence but you can't uh, not notice we have beautiful Taryn in the chamber tonight. Just like to make a special welcome to our newest addition to our council family who's made an appearance in person and uh, would go without saying at the top of the meeting also uh, to note that one of our, we've just had Mother's Day and one of our fabulous uh, female councils who also a mother uh, Councillor Walk, his daughter, is turning 18 today, I found out. So thank you for being with us today as a mother and someone who is also working for the community. Uh, it is always a bit of a juggle. I completely, I've missed a few birthdays over the years. So thank you for being with us on uh, your daughter's 18th birthday. And thank you for bringing Taryn in for us to all celebrate his addition to our family. Uh, and in doing that, the first item is the confirmation of the previous minutes. Councillor McKenzie, seconded by Councillor Adamchek. All those in favour, please raise your hand. 
all those against as there are no votes against. Uh, there's just uh, one item on the agenda and that's 7.1 53 Stevenson Place, Newcastle East, DA 2022-01127, Dwelling House Alterations and Additions. Do I have a mover of the motion? Councillor McKenzie, thank you. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Adamchek, would you like to speak to the motion, Councillor? Thank you, Lord Mayor. I've been here long enough, I think, now to have done every single house on Stevenson Place. It's, um, <laughs> I think, they're almost the exact same renovation and every, not to discredit the work that people do in their own individual designs, but we've seen this fairly often. Uh, it's, a difficult re it's a difficult renovation to make those houses livable by modern standards. Um, and often comes across the fact that the, the lot sizes are very small and, and come um, up against our um, FSR limitations. And this one, no different. Um, a relatively minor um, exceedance and no impacts on the surrounding and good corrections as well, or good negotiations with the council staff in order to um, minimise those impacts on the surrounding neighbours by the elimination of that top floor. Uh, very happy to support that this evening. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Would you like to speak a seconder, Councillor? Are there any other speakers? Uh, I would just add my support uh, for the motion before us and just acknowledge uh, Councillor McKenzie's comments, but also remind councillors we do have um, the heritage uh, study that's out for public exhibition, specifically in the Newcastle East End, to make sure obviously the heritage is protected, celebrated, and also uh, to hopefully make some of these processes uh, a little bit easier uh, so those heritage items can be uh, restored and, and invested in, which is a, another really important uh, piece of work, just like the pools that this council is doing. Uh, council, would you like a right of reply? I'll put the motion. All those in favour, please stand or raise your hand is fine. Uh, Councillor Church, Councillor McCabe, uh, Councillor McKenzie, Councillor Winnie Bartz, Councillor Duncan, Councillor Richardson, <laughs> Councillor Clawson, Councillor Adamchek, Councillor Barry, Councillor Walk, Councillor Poole, Councillor Nelms and Councillor Wood. <laughs> As there are no votes against, I declare that motion carried unanimously and that will close our development application committee at 7.20 p.m. Uh, thank you for your attendance. And as uh, you will see, we have workshops to follow this meeting as well. Thank you, councillors. <laughs>